Good morning. We want to call the session to order. Um, I guess there are some joining us online. Um, so we, we recognize you and uh, thank you for, for joining us um, from wherever, which part of the world that you joining us from. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me well? Can I go on? Okay, all right, okay. So thank you all for uh, spending your morning with us. Um, when we took on the challenge to raise a voice for the protection of the Atiwa forest, uh, we did not know that it would be a long journey. Along the way, it sometimes felt um, a bit lonely but every time it became difficult to turn a corner um, out of nowhere, many of you helped in various ways that sustained the campaign and also continue to put pressure on the government of Ghana, not to mind the Atiwa forest, but to make it a national park. Um, some of you wrote letters directly to the president some of you use your highly efficient networks to project the campaign. And some of you co-sponsored the Atiwa motion, which was massively voted for, and it's now resolution 087. And some of you even gave money through your organizations to support the campaign. That is why Atiwa is still standing and will stand till eternity. Til eternity. And for this, we say this, thank you. Thank you. Um, our invitation yeah. for, this session for this session even came to you late, but you prioritize it above all else and join us this morning. I welcome you all to the session to gather ideas and support for Atiwa National Park. So thank you, thank you for honoring our invitation. I will at this point um, invite my colleague, Jan Kamstra from the IUCN Netherlands Committee to take over the moderation of the rest of the program. Um, shall we um, give a clap as yeah. Jan comes in? Jan. I'm just moderating, huh? <laughs> Not a big, not such a big thing. Um, yeah, also on behalf of ICN Netherlands, uh, welcome. Uh, in fact, if we talk about the work in uh, Atiwa, uh, we have been involved really as, as a partner, not just supporting financially, but I think we have been uh, really active in, uh, in say a lot of the activities that have started with Arosha, but even if, if we see at the story of Atiwa, it started even before that. I think already in the uh, 80s, 90s, uh, groups have started to, uh, to protect it also against the bauxite threat. Uh, for today, uh, so in fact, what we will do is give a short update on uh, what has happened so far. And uh, from there, uh, use this gathering to come up with uh, ideas on how to proceed. Uh, from the presentation, it will be clear that we are, uh, we already now working on this for seven years and it could maybe even take another 10 years. So how do we take, how do we keep this momentum to make the change? That's, I think that is the biggest challenge we have. Uh, Daryl will, explain but uh, yeah, as I said, he will say uh, where we are now. And then we hope with you to see uh, if there are um, situations where you know from or where you think uh, that can be helpful for us to know uh, how we can and put pressure on the government to make the change, but also uh, um, with respect to the type of investments 
which are needed to uh, uh, protect Atiwa and uh, the surrounding uh, in, the, in the future. So thank you again for coming. Uh, I will give the floor to Daryl. Daryl, you have your own mic, I think, or I give my mic. You have, you have it? Okay, I'll give it to you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Jan, and also to all of you who have joined us here and those online. I am going to try and give you a small overview of that forest, where we are now, and where we are seeking to go. So before I start, I think for those of you who are new and don't know where Zali Atiwa is, I just want to show you the location of Atiwa in Ghana. So Atiwa Forest is located in the eastern region of Ghana. And um, as you can see, it's much down there. And the forest is a green area, very green area in the light um, green area you can see. And it is about 33.5% of the Eastern region forest cover. And because the forest is located on a hill, we don't have too many hills in Ghana, but this particular forest is the second highest peaks in the country. And the forest sits directly on the mountain. And because of the mountain ecosystem, um, one of the world's most renowned biologists, E.O. Wilson, has described this forest as one of the most unique and finest example of upland evergreen ecosystem in the country. So if you really are looking for right now, hotspots in the world, this is one of the most critical areas you have to go. And the forest as it is because of its unique nature, it has benefited from several protection status. And this started with its first gazetting as a forest reserve in 1926 by the traditional authorities and then later by government. We also saw it becoming a special biological protection area in 1994. And in 1999, it became a globally significant biodiversity area. As we speak in 2006, it became a legacy KBA status as a key biodiversity area. And currently it is now, an, is now part of the list of Alliance for Zero Extinction Areas in the world. What makes Atua very, very crucial for us and important for us and the work we do? First of all, the forest, because of its upland nature, is one of the most very unique watersheds in the country. It serves 5 million Ghanaians with water. There are three major rivers that feed three regions in the country. And as a result, it provides water for over 5 million Ghanaians who depend on it directly. Secondly, the forest is a biodiversity hotspot. Endemism is so great, almost every year that scientific work continues in the forest, new species are being discovered. According to research we've done over the years, there are over 227 species of birds, 50 mammals, and 32 amphibians. Butterflies, it has one of the largest collection of butterflies in the whole of West Africa, with over 100 species critically endangered, and I can say 28 species that are also in danger of glo global extinction. So with this kind of wealth of biodiversity, we have no choice than to conserve this area together with its water provisioning services. But what is down the current risks and threat? Somewhere in 2017, the government of Ghana set itself an agenda to develop the aluminum industry to provide jobs for Ghanaians and also enable Ghana to get some sort of foreign exchange from the export of aluminum related products. And as you can see, these are the locations that were targeted for government aluminum development plants. And Atiwa is the last place. So when you see Chebi here, this is Atiwa. So Chebi is a specific town where you find the Atua forest. And government was targeting to also do bauxite in this area. The 
Now, I want you to see the bigger picture of Atiwa in the whole bauxite industry that the government plants. If you look at the bauxite reserves in the country, Atiwa's deposit of bauxite is just about 18%. And government of Ghana can develop a thriving aluminum industry without actually touching the 18%. And our case has been all along that considering the water services, the biodiversity, we do not as a country need to touch the 18% because opportunity cost and the trade-off is much greater that, than the income we're going to get from bauxite industry. And in view of the risk, the potential risk of losing the forest to land conversion to areas like these. So this is a comparative bauxite site in Ghana, somewhere also in the Western region. <clears throat> this site has been under bauxite mining for over 80 years and the forest cover in that area has been significantly lost. This is Atiwa, as you see, we don't want a situation like this. It's a risk we cannot afford as a country. And so to do that, to address that, we set ourselves, we set ourselves on the pathway of engaging CSOs in Ghana, communities, to do a lot of lobby and advocacy. And that lobby targeted a lot, the general public and also the media to ensure that we rally national support to secure the forest against bauxite mining. Again, the advocacy and lobby was backed by significant research support coming from several institutions like um, Help Ghana, also from Arusha International supporting, and uh, also colleagues from WAPCA supporting. So that led to also the discovery of um, the white name Manga Bay, which had not been seen in the world for some time, and also new species to science, like the slippery frog, which recently was also published widely for everybody to see. And actually, some of these research and discoveries is what led to Atiwa becoming listed as an area and a, as part of the Alliance for Zero Extension site. So this research work is really crucial for the advocacy work we do with the communities as well. Then again, we've had significant support also from international NGOs and organizations who, like Seth said, have written letters to our president, have through several platforms, done a lot of lobby, and even we've had support from private companies like BMW, Suco, and Tetra Pak, all because of our connections with the international bodies that also support conservation. And I have to say, it is not just these organizations. Several more organizations have pitched in their strength to support this advocacy. So far, we are on course and the support of these organizations have been very enormous and tremendous, but we are not done yet. So it means that for all of us here, we still have a lot to do. Now, to, give government, to keep government on its toes and to show that we're also very serious about securing the forest, we needed to do all it takes. Because at some point, despite all the lobby, government undertook a prospecting activity in the forest. And to stop that, we had to take government to court. And as a result, together with several NGOs and other individuals, we filed a case in court since, 2000, since 2000, 2020. And since then, we have also used the media to propagate the issue of the case that is in court to the extent that we've had the Chinese media also significantly supporting the campaign. Now, what has been most critical in terms of support has been traditional authority. In the beginning, the traditional authority, which is also connected somehow to the presidency, was, had indicated that they were going to be very careful in terms of how they get involved. But within the last month, we've seen the traditional authorities standing up strongly and saying that we want to see a national park for Atiwa. So this is actually boosting our effort and advocacy to make sure that Atwa really becomes a national park. That we believe gives us an opportunity for all of us to think about how do we make the national park a reality? 
Now, we have not only been talking and walking on the street and knocking on the doors of government, we have also been giving proposals of green sustainable options to government. We have been putting it on their table for them to give a consideration. So these are just a few of them. And our interest is not in only what happens in Atiwa, but also we have an interest in what happens to bauxite mining in the other locations that government is targeting. Because bauxite mining involves destructive environmental activities, and we need to ensure that there's due diligence, there's environmental sustainability, no matter where it happens. So it doesn't have to be sustainable only in Natiwa, if it should happen, but everywhere else. And so we are concerned about that. Again, we think that if we want to create jobs, there are several options of value addition enterprises within the enclave of Atwa that we can explore. And this is one of the key things we put on the table. So one of them is a cocoa value chain. You can look at organic cocoa. And already I can say we've seen certain partners coming in to help support with this initiative. We believe that it can be scaled up with the necessary investment. Okay. Again, crucial to secure Atiwa for the water service and biodiversity services, we need to upgrade the current management regime of the forest. It's a forest reserve. To give it maximum protection, this forest needs to become a national park. And with the national park status, clearly no activities of extraction can happen there. And that is why we think that as a first step to moving forward to securing the forest, we need to make it a national park. And even that, we can use the national park to also recognize the traditional influence and also support by naming the park after the traditional authorities who have supported its creation. Then again, we also see several opportunities for high-end green value commodities, mostly based on non-timber forest products, like griffonia, like um, grains of paradise, and also Vokanga. These are high-end non-timber products that really feature in the international pharmaceutical industry and also spices and food industry, which can be explored to create jobs. So we are also prioritizing jobs by looking at the, the green pathways that can make it possible. Now, this is all that has been happening. We've pushed government to the um, to look at the green pathways. We've explored and shared several opportunities, but we also have several apps because at this point, government is listening to what is happening and also the current interest in global climate emergency and biodiversity action. Government is considering some of these options we are putting at the table. They need investment to make it happen. We are also keen about the fact that if investment is coming, how will that investment also guarantee the outcomes that we seek? And even the investors who are coming, they also need certain guarantees. Is it that they give the investment and the government just takes the money and walk away? Or what really happens? We want to make sure that we can get investment that satisfies both the interest of government and also the outcome for at what that we seek. So for us, it's a key question we are asking. We don't have the solutions and that's why we invite you here. And we want you to share with us what some of these ideas you have, your own experiences, how we can make this happen. And maybe I will end here and let um, Jan um, lead the session on the questions and also to invite you to make the proposals as to some of these key questions that we have and we want to also solicit your views in terms of how we can take it forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Daryl, for this uh, inspiring talk. And uh, yeah, maybe it, a lot of is known to me, but I think it's always uh, even to look at it again and to see where we come from and when, Again, also to be uh, recorded about the richness of the area is, uh, is, is always good to remind why we are doing this campaign. So uh, before we go into deep, maybe there are still some questions people have concerning the presentation itself. I don't know if there are specific questions, yes? 
question. It has been clean, so okay. Yes, it's okay. It's, it's it works. Yes. Uh, I'm Nicolas. I work for Noe, a French organization, and we work very closely with uh, Seth and Daryl from Arosha. Uh, thanks. I think it's very clear, and uh, it's super interesting to see where we stand now. I just want to know uh, what has, I mean, since 2020, since you went to court, uh, what, I mean, and now we are in September 2021, where we stand now. Uh, it, do you still have some kind of prospection uh, within the area where, because when I went in June, or I don't know, we were told that Chinese are not so so far and there are some kind of ideas to come in. So maybe, yes, is it still, I mean, the area is still uh, without any prospection so far. And how do you see the timeline in terms with the government? You said that the government commits to maybe find another alternative. Do you have one year, two years, three years? What is the what do you have in mind? And the third question is in terms of advocacy with the EU. I mean, we know that the EU the, there's kind of new program, uh, you know, for the next years with EU funding. Did you already manage to discuss with them about what you have been doing so far? I mean, the great work, and we all know that there's a huge potential for green jobs and green uh, environment, uh, a green economy within the Atewa landscape. So. Just to, to have a, yes, a, a, some updates uh, with some figures uh, so far. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And yes, uh, since 2020, when we filed the case in court, uh, I think right after we had all these issues of COVID coming up, so a lot of the courts um, cases or plan were, were stored for a while. And also to pitch our case in court, we needed um, witnesses. So we explored both um, Ghanaian witnesses and also international witnesses who had experience with the bauxite industry and can adequately speak to the issue of what the potential risks will be. So in trying to explore that, there were several witnesses we tried to get, but because of COVID, they couldn't even assist the process because crucial to the process of expert testimonies, they needed to come to Ghana experience the forest, know what it looks like, and really make a very factual case in court. So that's really delayed. But as we speak, that has progressed. We, were, we actually filed for direction from the court. The court has given us a date. And I know that between now and the end of the year, there's likely going to be a first hearing of, of the case. So we're still progressing with that. But also, like you said, um, government intention I would say is gradually growing. Intention to look at the green options is growing. Also from the pressure and also their own observation of the global international community on issues of um, climate action and biodiversity issues. They are warming up to some of the green solutions that we are proposing. We can't say if whether it's going to happen in a year or two, but that's how come these processes, like I said, if we can show clearly the investment potential and viability of these processes, they would possibly, if we can say, this is an investment for development of a national park, this is an investment for development of the green businesses we are talking about, I'm sure within a very short time, even before the end, they could say, let's do it. Let's make it happen. And we are looking at COP26 for our government to make certain bold declarations on their commitment to the world and making that way a national park. So we are staying positive, but that is, I mean, for us, how we, we engage in the process with government. Now on the EU, yes, um, EU has, um, I'll say for some time now, shown very key interest in what is happening also because of the EU Green Deal. And we've had discussions with the EU and they have offered to put their technical services and also financial resources at the disposal of all the stakeholders to make sure that we can realize this object. So at the moment, there are key partners that we are seeking to work with and engage with to even drive and help government also see the green potentials that we are looking at. So there, there, are, there are potential prospects um, with the EU that we are going to follow up on. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Another question behind, yeah, next, yeah. Hello, Daryl. Um, I was just wondering what uh, contacts have you with the please opposition you, party? Hello. Please can you introduce yourself? Please? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm Brendan Dempsey. I'm not with anyone. I'm just a citizen. Uh, <laughs> okay, I've, I've, met, I've met Daryl before. Um, 
Daryl, I was wondering what contact you have with the NDC, with the opposition party in Ghana, because you'll have another election in, in three years. The last one was very tight. So while you're putting pressure on the on the government, which is now run by the NPP, what guarantees do you know if they said, right, this is it, we're not doing anything here? Uh, do you know if the NDC's position is going to be uh, sympathetic with that? And are you putting pressure on them to say, you can't, you can't go back, you, we can't have this back and forth where one party says we're for it and the other party says that we're against it. And, and therein possibly lies the danger that the Chinese government will say, well, well, we'll wait it out for a few years and see if the other party gets in and then we'll, we'll try that way. So don't, I don't know what contact you have with, with NDC or, or is there support within the NDC to make Atwa a national park? All right. Oh, thanks very much. Um, we have been very careful of the way we engage political parties when it comes to this campaign. I think we want to stick to the fact and we want to avoid situations where they politicize this campaign and align it with a particular political entity. As we found out um, in the last election, the NDC prioritized the creation of a national park for Atiwa. So in a sense, they have already indicated their commitment to support the agenda to make Atiwa a national park. But even that, we are careful because until they have power, you can never really be sure what they really want to do. And so we have tried not to play this campaign into the hands of any political party. We are staying true to the course of making sure that it doesn't matter which party is in power, we follow suit and pursue the agenda. So, but we are mindful of your own commitment. And in their manifestos from the, the last election, NDC was very, very clear on what they will do with the, national, with the Atiwa Forest if they become the next government. So we believe that in the next election, they will still have that hope and prioritize Atiwa. But at the same time, we are very careful and cautious in how we play this campaign into any political hands. We want to stay as much as possible neutral, stick to the game to avoid any politicization as can easily happen in, in, in our case. Thank you. And just a small comment before, it's not the Chinese that wants the bauxite. Eh? It's the government of Ghana that thinks with the bauxite, they can develop their country. And the Chinese have just landed money. Maybe the Chinese will, but the Chinese are not in a hurry. They, are, they have their resources everywhere. So that's also an important, because often people think it's, it's China. China just landed money so they can build roads and, and they spend the money. So the pressure to pay back that money that's also a question we are dealing with. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, my name is My name is uh, Mariela, and I am the founder and project manager of a very small NGO called Microsphere. We work in Kakum National Park. And we work in collaboration with the Wildlife Division, who is the manager of the National Park. Um, so thank you very much for this fantastic real life case study, perfect case study of how we can move about the, the creation of a real protected area, of an actual protected area, not a paper park. Um, my question would be, how do you involve uh, the government's instances, not the political instances, but the the executive bodies, like for example, the uh, the Forestry Commission, which, if I understand well, is officially responsible for the management of uh, forest reserves. Thank you. So um, I will say that the sources of this campaign, as has been indicated so far, has not only relied on the support of international NGOs and local bodies and all of that. The Forestry Commission has played a very key role. This campaign, I mean, right now we say 2017, but as far back as 2012, there was pressure on this particular forest. And it took the work and engagement with the Forestry Commission to kind of stall any development in relation to the bauxite and Atua forest. So clearly the Forestry Commission has been a key partner of course, we recognize that 
in some of the regimes that we find ourselves, there are instances where executive capture can also slow the engagement of some of the forestry committee um, officers. And so we've had situations where once the government is in power and has indicated that this is a policy I want to pursue, other government agencies must also align. So we've had situations where, even though we used to have a lot of strong support from the Forestry Commission, it's still there, but not as before. But as government also warms up to the, to the prospect of the green opportunities and all of that, we see Forestry Commission also gradually going to fit in and also work towards that agenda. So as to the commitment of the Forestry Commission, we are not in doubt. They are the mandated agency. They have a commitment to do that, and we work with them very uh, closely. At the landscape level, we have the support of the FSD who are managing the park, and currently, as we speak, we are looking at undertaking activity of reforestation of degraded areas within the forest. So clearly, as to sustainability, we are all thinking about it, but also we foresee, we see also the pressure that can somehow dampen their efforts and slow their own commitments to the process. But we closely engage with them and they support a lot of the actions that we are taking on the ground. Yeah. This is also the last clarifying question or whatever, because I want also to go a little bit in depth about or in depth in the sense, uh, not too much in depth because we're only 50 minutes, so that's not much. But the thing is, of course, we are in a very insecure situation. Even with the, uh, if the other government be the opposition, maybe they also just leave it as it is. Because what you, they can just leave it as it is. Maybe they are not so much interested in bauxite, but keeping the option open is always good in the political sense, I guess, not to be too clear where you go. And also, the opposition has to pay back money to the Chinese. So someone has to pay, there'll be a payback time. So anyway, so that's a little bit where we are standing now. Like, the question is then, okay, we like to attract investment. We see European Union is interested. So we see a lot of public funders who are interested. Interested. We see maybe private sector is interested. But the situation is very insecure. So why should you invest? millions when you the next year or something uh, it can really go on and you lose your investment so that's a little bit where we, we stand up now. now i want to profit from uh the presence of a uh, dutch colleague from the wolves company who did in fact uh together with the university of um, uh, amsterdam we did a study on the economics the ecosystems and biodiversity cheap study also as a basis for the former government because they asked like come with some do show the value so that's what we did so we showed if you do the bauxite if you do a little bit of bauxite and this or you have the forest so it turned out of course that the water issue will be a big issue but that's 20 years from now so before you're going to appreciate the water which and the value is much more up that's different from what you can get directly from the bauxite and of course it's also who profits from it the bauxite is for a certain group and profit from it the others from it. so uh maybe and i think because esther has been working a lot of countries so maybe you can also from the experience from the deep studies where it worked how how you look at this issue because i think you have been confronted with this <laughs> question with uh, in in many more countries thank you very much esther Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I don't have to introduce myself. <laughs> um, I just just say something very briefly, and then I'll give over to my colleague Anilka Guzman. He is our conservation expert. But um, looking at your situation, I think it's very important to get a good picture that is needed for the investment to secure the national park, and that doesn't mean only the investment in the sense of um, investing in the park and maintaining it, but also looking at all the benefits the park generates. And so there are different benefits. We're talking about water supplies, we're talking about bulk seed. So we're talking about economic benefits, but also social benefits like jobs, um, being able to go to the forest to pick um, uh, forest products. So I think that it's really important 
to very structurally create insight in all those different benefits and flows. And then from there, go to the next step and see, okay, what kind of investment or investors are interested in which aspects, whether they are social, maybe connected to SDGs or whether they are financial return on investment. And then try to create a strategy in which you in time access those different funds that should generate benefits for the different stakeholders. Well, I'm, I think I'm just gonna give it to Milka. Thank you. Well, thanks for the presentation. It was great to see the update. Um, I'm glad I, I came here this morning also to see, to see you all, the IUCN, the Netherlands team. Um, I'm Amilcar Guzman. I work with Esther at Wolf's company and I, I specialize in conservation trust funds and protected area finance. And something we have, uh, I think it's something probably based on that experience is that what we have done with conservation trust funds shows that having an independent entity that can manage funds and provide transparency to international donors or potential investors is really beneficial for attracting larger amounts of funds. So I was wondering if you have considered, not necessarily a conservation trust fund because that's a very specific governance model, but there might be other vehicles or other governance structures that can provide this type of transparency and governance in, term, in terms of managing funding at the national level and to provide continuity. So that's very important in terms of, uh, well, all the discussion about the political changes, right? So if the government changes after four years, then you make sure that you still have an entity that can manage those funds and can still communicate with the international investors or with the international donors, even in that case, and that they can have a seat on the table with the government because they have the funds as well. So that, that's also a reason why these institutions sometimes become more influential, influential because they have the money, they, they are the ones managing the funds. And I think in this case, um, I, I think of course, for these green investments and all the enterprises and the trade-offs you, men you mentioned, that could be very beneficial. And in addition to paying for conservation costs or, or maybe other activities. So I don't know if you have considered such a structure, if you think that's feasible, um, if you have any ideas of what could be done in, in Ateo in particular. So main, mainly a question, I, 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 I give it back to you. All right, uh, thank you very much for those insights. I actually see them as um, suggestions and insights for us to take home because at the moment, that's why we are having this session. Uh, we are looking for ideas on strategies and options we can consider. So, I mean, with what you have said, you are actually proposing to us to consider strongly a vehicle such as setting up a conservation trust fund and having an independent entity that can also help to manage such funds if they come in. So I would flag that, not try to respond to you, but definitely for us, we take it as insights that would, would put down as part of the key things we need to consider. And we are also, I mean, hoping that we, we also get to hear more to add to this. So we are very open at this moment and want to take all of them in a stride as we go along. Thank you, thank you very much. Good at, please. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thanks also for the, the beautiful presentation of the, um, the case. It was very clear. And even if I, I had the privilege of being there, then getting this all, this, seeing this again, very helpful. Thank you. Um, I was thinking you were, you were soliciting for ideas on strategy. Yeah. So, what I noted from your story is that you sort of have a different access strategy. You, know, you have a biodiversity case a line, which is, you know, has EO Wilson and has uh, uh, the international community, et cetera, and IUCN. Um, and it seems to me that that has been quite successful in getting through, but uh, you always have to think what how things will develop or what can be done more. 
the second thing is um, this business cases, and it has been a lot of attention has gone in the business case, both for what you want. Um, but I haven't indeed heard much about what Jan said, is that even though is there you have a, a local business case for investment and the park management and the surrounding support structure and eco, uh, tourism and all that, which is quite challenging. But even if you have that, then still, it seems to me that the Ghana, the government of Ghana has this issue of it being part of a loan deal for funds and cash that they had spent. So this, this, so there also needs to be a, an alternative to divert the, to get rid of the link between this massive loan of, I think, was it $8 billion um, tied to the reserves under it. So something else should come in place. And where should that come from? And and I haven't heard that that much about that. And I'm not sure whether it's it's Arrocha that can solve it, but it needs to be solved for the government, it seems to me. And the last one, which I think um, it seems to me can be pursued um, maybe a bit stronger is sort of your your cultural and spiritual case. Because in the end, also for politicians, if, and I sense that when I was there and you, you told it that there, people don't want this because of different reasons, because they are related to the forest, because they want a healthy environment. Um, but also deep, deep down, they don't, you know, it's their last piece of, of forest and play that card. And also I was here in a session on faith, leader, the faith leaders, they said it very clearly. I mean, we should stop commoditizing nature, et cetera. So using faith, and I think Ghana is a highly religious country, um, play that card and maintain it, especially if there's elections upcoming, because it's sort of a independent of any economic argument. Just a few thoughts. Okay, I think, thanks very much, um, Conrad. I think that's a very good observation. Um, we have not deliberately ignored the aspects of the loan deal. It's actually part of all our engagement and, and that is how come we were keen to show the, the part of Atiwa in the whole bauxite deal, that's 18%. If you look at the rest of the whole bauxite, it can more than pay for the loan deal and the obligations that goes with the loan. What government is actually trying to do is try to use the bauxite to create more jobs. And as a result, it's looking at all the areas where bauxite can be found. And that's why if you look at the four phased out uh, projects, the bauxite project of government, there are four sites. There is a first site, which is Awaso, a second site, which is Yinehini, and the third site is a second site again in Yinehini, and that's what is the fourth one on the list. So it's all a matter of looking at creation of jobs. So the first two sites can pay for the deal, even with surplus, the loan deal with several surplus for government to do whatever. It's just a matter of creating more jobs. And that is how come, be mindful of that, of the job creation, we are telling government that for Atiwa, the trade-offs are so huge, don't do bauxite, but consider the green value chains as a way of pushing for jobs. Because that is more long-term, we can still get our water services, we can still get our biodiversity services. So it's, it's, it's a very crucial thing that we've not lost sight of the loan arrangement, but also rather making sure that you don't make um, Atwa a collateral for something you really don't need to have. We don't need the box size in Atwa because in the other two sites, you can do the box size more effect effectively, efficiently, and um, respecting all environmental yeah, safety and time. still make your, and still be able to meet the loan obligations that government has with China. Um, I can answer very quickly on the traditional, on faith, maybe, or maybe Seth, you can also answer on that. Sure. No, I'm I'm not from the region. The thing of they play a lot of tradition, and the thing is, the president and a lot of his uh, colleagues, friends, are from that region. So the tradition is, in in fact, uh, it, it's very heat because you have you have seen the the Ochehene. He is against it, 
but he's part of the family of the president. And that's where, where faith, tradition, what your legacy, all those things are, are mixed up. So making it even, even more, more complex. Maybe you want to say still a little thing on that uh, set shortly. Okay, so um, in addition to that, I mean, the Ochehine, which is the paramount chief of the area, has been very supportive. And from the beginning, we've worked with him until his cousin became the president and said, I'll mind Bauxite. And he told us in confidence that he was not going to contradict um, his cousin. Uh, so, you know, a few years, you know, he didn't comment. But lately, and just the last six months, he's come out strongly that he preferred a national park in his area and that we are riding on it and we are re-engaging with him. So there's also a shift again in the area, in the traditional area towards a national park. And we are even suggesting strongly that we should name a national park either after him or the one who came after him. Thanks so much. Yes, uh, Nicholas, please. Okay, yes, it's also. Uh, uh, hi, uh, Daryl. Uh, my name is Nicholas Warren, and I, I work for Russia International. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, and again, and I, I was just thinking, as all of us have to think in transforming our economies, like uh, all over the world, to meet the uh, environmental and climate crisis, uh, what scope do you think to develop something that is actually not uh, old economic thinking, but progressive economic thinking uh, that meets environmental, social, and, uh, and economic uh, considerations? And in, in that, with that in mind, um, I know that a lot of enterprises downstream benefit from the waters upstream. Um, do you think there's a uh, scope for with the government to develop some uh, a new kind of economy with a public private uh, initiatives or something like that ac across the landscape so uh, looking at how a uh is you know develop something uh, within the landscape of a not just focusing on a thank you Okay, so thanks a lot. Um, I think right from the beginning, when we talk about Atiwa, we are not just looking at the 23,000, approximately 23,000 hectares of the forest. We are looking at the entire landscape, which also includes about eight local government authorities, several decentralized state agencies, the traditional authority, all in that land space so it's, it's a land it's, it's a landscape approach you are looking at and like you said yes we are actually looking at public private partnerships with uh, the community with communities and for some of the enterprises we are talking about you it's it's it might be very difficult for just a single entity to drive it and we, i mean there's been talk about payment for ecosystem services water services and all of that and for such initiatives water services in ghana are run by state-owned corporations so definitely we are going to see some public private partnerships in there, but we need to develop that mechanism that can make that system work. Until then, I think we are still working in the blind. And this is something definitely with the suggestions coming on board, looking at the um, understanding what the investment needs are and then going ahead to develop a strategy to assess them. We will then explore which partnership will best make this happen. And I think it's very crucial that we take that strongly on board. So um, thanks a lot for that. Yeah. Okay, could I profit yeah? No, no, Nicholas, I want you to interview because I know Norway Conservation is also involved in really a management of protected areas. So maybe also you have some ideas or some experience you'd like to share about, especially about say how investors, what are the minimum criteria investors are, are looking for to say, okay, yes, we could become part of that in, in the context you just described. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Jan. Uh, yes, Noe uh, works very closely with Arusha on developing green value chain. I think the work has even started with, with you, Daryl. In uh, I think there's a consultant that is ongoing to to map what can be I mean what can be extracted on a sustainable way from Atiwa landscape. 
But besides that, yes, we work also on trying to, 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 uh, to take over uh, parks through uh, management delegation. We have a kind of mentoring program with uh, African Parks Network. So now Noe works in, with three national parks. Uh, I'm not a specialist, there's another guy, but uh, I think connections are already made. Uh, what I can say is, uh, I think it's um, according to what I understand from national parks perspective from Noe, they try to have a bigger park because I think it's, it's difficult to, well, to work on a small, on a small park. Uh, I think 23,000 might be a, a bit low. But I think what is interesting is it's in the area, it's, it's, you have a, a potential park, but you have also some cream out, uh, you know, on the surrounding. So I think it's the landscape that uh, we need to, uh, to work on. Uh, and, and so my question was also to, uh, I know that you are in touch with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation. I think uh, I understood that last year they, they put it, their emphasis on the Galapagos archipelago with a lot of millions, not billions, but at least dozens of millions. So I'm just wondering, is, it, is there any kind of opportunity to say, okay, Leonardo, just give us 50 millions so that it will get the government calm for five years with maybe money that can help paying back, I don't know, some things. And so that you can already, because it, it's easy for Leonardo to give a, a big check, I think. So is it something that you have already in mind? Uh, and is there anything that we can do together to support you in that way? Uh, though that, that's why a, a bit my question. Okay, um, thank you very much. Yes, um, we've had um, Leonardo support the campaign um, along the way, and we are still in touch with them. So. This is all through the network of international partners we are engaging with. And um, that's possibility, the suggestion is something that is not far from what we, we intend to act on. Uh, very much, I will give the word just to set for, for the closing of the session and on behalf of Aishin and all the partners, thank you very much for being here. Okay, so um, there's, uh, you know, how much we can do in one hour. But I think we have uh, utilized it well. Um, it's been very interactive. There are great suggestions that we've had here. Actually, that's why we came here. We were stuck with ideas, but there are wonderful ideas that you've given. We're going to sit down and uh, you know, articulate them, and we're going to take action. So thank you all very much. I know you are rushing to your next sessions. Um, the rest of the days here, we're going to interact, and also we're going to reconnect by emails and all that and deepen the relationship and then the interaction. We still need your idea. We need to push um, to get Atiwa a national park. So those online also, um, I saw all of you, Jeremy uh, popped up. Um, so thank you all uh, very much.